grateful for your company. And I am doing the usual. It's about half past nine. And I've had my second flat white. I'm seated in the Empire Cafe in Musenberg. And this week has been a particularly difficult in many ways. So instead of boring you with my own thoughts, I found a book which I'm going to share with you. It was around midnight on the 17th of November. Loud banging on the parking door woke me. I was annoyed by the banging. It was late and I had just gone to sleep. I thought that it was probably a neighbor who usually banged on the door rather than not. I was in a daze as I walked into the kitchen to open the door wearing nothing but my underwear. I had barely opened the door when I was overwhelmed by the rush of heavily armed men pushing their way through the apartment. All I saw was a blow of guns and helmets and lights. I let out a scream as they overpowered me. Three or four men grabbed me and violently turned me around and bashed my face into the wall. I could feel the force of someone leaning into my back and I felt the hard metal of a gun against the back of my head. Stand up, stand up, one of them was yelling simultaneously. Men rushed in and ripped my roommate from his bed. With my face pressed viciously against the white kitchen wall, I felt something inside me collapse. Oh God, I'm going to die. At first I resisted the grip that my attacker had on me, but this earned me fist blows to my lower back. I couldn't breathe. After a while, the intruder pressing against my back released me while the other moved his gun down the middle of the back, the cold metal pressing deep into my muscles and grinding against my spine. In those few moments, I was absolutely convinced that the intruders were going to kill us. This was South Africa and they were white men with guns. We were black kids and they had forced their way into the apartment to kill us. There were about 10 of them armed and dressed for battle with helmets and bulletproof vests. Although I had screamed once when they entered the apartment, it felt as if screaming in, the screaming in my head continued. Loud piercing shrieks echoed all around my head. My first guess was that they were the bit bolder. A white supremacist group allegedly, allegedly traveling the country killing black people. The white ball over top of my mind because just two days earlier, Baron Stradorn, who claimed to be their leader, went on a shooting screen for Victoria killing seven and wounding 15. People say your life flashes before you when you're facing death, but my life didn't flash before me. I was consumed with terror and fully believed that these men had come to kill me. Within a few minutes, it was all quiet. I was still pinned to the wall at their mercy. All my visions of doing great things and breaking free from the change of a budget were gone. That feeling of aloneness came over me the way that's, that I felt that morning when I was told to leave the bus. Only this time, it was with fear. Please let me live. I don't want to die. I prayed, quivering in silence. There was a constant talking among them in Afrikaans. After a few seconds, the bearers of the gun stepped away from me. I was grabbed by the arm and pulled around and shoved with my back against the kitchen wall. For the first time, I could see the faces of my assailants. Some of them didn't look much older than me. They kept their guns trained on me with looks of venom in their eyes. I felt lame and my feeling was labored. I worried that I might have an asthma attack. One of the intruders explained that they were from a special unit with the South African police acting under the state of emergency regulations. 
This was a serious statement. It implied that they would treat us as a threat to the to state security, giving them complete latitude to do as they pleased with us. The government had become notorious for its use of the emergency laws to violate, repress resistance to apartheid and intimidate citizens. The men began to search our apartment, causing havoc. Everything was overturned. Clothes were thrown out of the cupboards, books and notes were paged through and just dumped on the floor. They went through everything, my letters, my diaries, my photos, my personal belongings. They demanded to see my, our identity documents and our student cards. The, question to, the questions they barked at us, what are your names, who lives here, who's in charge, where are you from? They all looked like killers to me except one. He was young with light brown hair and pale blue eyes. He stood frozen, looking more frightened than I was. I looked into his frightened eyes and for a moment our eyes met. Even though he stood there pointing a loaded gun at me, I felt sad for him. We both seemed to be in agony. It was the first time that I realized they are victims on both sides of every man-made atrocity. Pushing Boulders is a testimony of, to a remarkable person whose life history and experience will undoubtedly be an inspiration to many people. The book gives us hope to achieve our dreams no matter how small or unrealistic they may seem. For Ethel's life is certainly a life being lived well, not just materially but ethically and in a compassionate way. The book, which is a delight to read, is a tribute to, re to, to resilience and determination of the human spirit. And these words were from my school teacher at West Virginia, Professor Zubaydah Desai, the Dean of Education, University of Western Cape. Go and have a good summer.